My name is Heather Beck and I own Canine Lifeline in Draper, Utah. We're a training-based facility where we focus on, obviously, training, boarding, and structured daycare. We are the world leaders in creating better human and dog relationships. There are many types of training out there. To clarify, Canine Lifeline takes a behavioral approach when working with dogs. We are relationship-based and focused on the dog's primal drives and instincts to better communicate. All of our training programs are heavily dependent on the owner's involvement and commitment. Dogs are living, breathing creatures and each requires time and patience to develop into great companions. The first steps to changing any behavior is to change the root of the problem, which means changing the context of the relationship between you and your dog. After almost 20 years of working with thousands of dogs and clients in homes, at parks, at our training center, and with students around the world, Canine Lifeline has developed a simple five-step program that does exactly that. Each dog is different, and as you are working with your dog, remember working with dogs is a skill and an art form that takes practice to develop. Your dog already knows how to speak its language, and it's your time to learn, so you can build a better relationship with man's best friend. When watching through this video, there's going to be several terms that you'll want to make yourself familiar with. When dogs are confronted with new situations, they have one of four responses. Fight, flight, avoid, and accept. Fight. Fight may look like barking, whining, growling, or biting. When fight occurs with a head halter or muzzle, the dog may toss their head, paw at it, lay down, alligator roll, or jump up. Fight may also happen the first time a dog has any new collar or leash applied. This can often happen with young puppies or feral dogs, older dogs that have never had any type of collar or leash on. Flight. This means to move away with intent to get away from a new situation. This often happens with dogs that are, once again, fearful, but most of our training starts with on the leash, so the flight's a little bit more difficult for them to practice, but we will see that as well. To avoid, this means to stop oneself from doing something. When avoiding, a dog may be looking in the other direction, possibly holding their head low, mouth closed, licking their lips, or yawning. Accept, to agree or consent. Dogs will look calm and comfortable, soft body, soft eyes, open mouth, smooth forehead, and ears back. This state of mind can never be forced. Contact pressure. Contact pressure means anything touching the dog. This could be a leash, a collar, a head halter, or your hands, etc. Distance pressure. Distance pressure means eye contact and body language. This is any gap of space between the dog and the handler or a dog and another dog. A structured activity. This is any activity between a dog and a handler that has rules and specific objectives. This includes, but is not limited to walks and fetch. Fixed space. This is any visual boundary like a dog bed, a blanket, or a place board. Unfixed space. This means to use eye contact and body language to move a dog into a lower body position anywhere at any time, usually used as a correction or to slow down behavior. Step one, to teach the tool. Basically to teach the tool means to start any dog with any tool, getting them comfortable with it and what it means. How we're working with dogs is helping dogs to understand pressure and the release of pressure. So the first part is to start to condition the dog into an area of little to no distraction to the tool. We don't wanna to bring too much into the picture when the dog is still just barely learning. So we wanna make sure that we're keeping it very simple for the dog to understand what we want from them. Also, in this step, patience is always gonna be your best tool. This just means that it's not about the walk. It's not about moving forward. It really is about just teaching the dog how to sit calmly next to you on a loose leash. And that's what this step is all about. So patience is gonna be very important in this step. What we're doing is we're using that contact pressure, the leash, the collar, the head halter, depending on what tool we're using, 
um, until the dog lowers its body into a sitting position. So we would just be holding up just enough pressure to get the dog to think about what we want from them. Once they lower their body into a sitting position, we release pressure. This is utilizing their naturally ingrained instincts to help the dog to understand that what they did when we release pressure is exactly what we wanted them to do. At this step, we're usually working through the process of flight. The dog really can't fly anywhere because we're utilizing the leash to help to limit that movement. But what we probably will see, and more often than not, when we're working with the head halters, either a head halter or the canine lifeline transitional leash, is fight. So in this moment, what we're trying to do is just to help the dog to understand that fight doesn't get them to the option that they want. Basically what fight does, what we're doing is just helping to slow that down, helping them to understand that once they lower into that sitting position, the release of pressure goes away. So as they're working through the fight, we're getting to know more about the dog. They're getting to know a little bit more about us. We're really helping to build that relationship that we're gonna follow through and be consistent with not just our pressure and the release of pressure, but also our timing of how to do that. Moving forward, only happens once the dog is calm. So when we're training dogs in this method, it's not about the walk. The walk is actually step two. So in step one, what we're teaching is actually how to get the dog to understand being calm in the first place, how to sit next to you on a nice loose leash. If you can't get the dog to sit next to you on a loose leash, you're never gonna get them to walk with you on one. So that's why step one is so imperative to teach the tool. Step two, moving forward together. So this is the part most people would associate with the walk and really important part, but keep in mind it is step two. So basically this means moving forward on a loose leash. At this point, we're working through avoidance and into acceptance. So as we're working with the dog, usually in step one, we start to get them into that sitting position, but they're not necessarily really comfortable with what we're doing. So what you're gonna see is the dog avoiding. So they'll move into that sitting position and they'll turn their head to the side. They might have their head a little bit low. They may be doing some licking. They're, you know, kind of looks like you ruined their birthday. But <laughs> trust me, it's all part of the process. And when you can recognize these phases of what the dog is gonna go through in the process, you're gonna be able to recognize each step as the dog is moving towards acceptance. But once we start moving with the dog and walking with the dog, what we start to see is we'll start to see the dog doing these little glances where they're gonna start looking up at us. And even when we stop and we utilize that gentle pressure to get them back into a sitting position, what you'll start to see is those little check-ins that they're gonna wanna start giving you eye contact, okay? So at this point, what I'm doing is I'm only matching the intensity of the dog with the leash pressure. So if the dog is kind of fussing and fighting, I wanna make sure that I wanna be consistent, but I also wanna be very fair with the dog as well and really take my time with that. And at this point, I'm really trying to transfer all of these concepts to lighter pressures. So pressure that you may need, that you may have needed in step one, you should start stop needing in step two, okay? So even when you stop, ideally the dog's gonna start to lower their, their into that sitting position very easily with very, very gentle pressure. You always wanna make sure that you're releasing pressure when the dog is doing it correctly. You do not wanna keep and being unfair to the dog because that release of pressure is their reward. That is that natural um, ingrained instinct that tells them that what they were doing right then and there was exactly what you wanted. So make sure that you're really fair and consistent with that. At this phase, when we're starting to move, if the dog starts to get out of position where we want them, which would be this nice pressure-free zone right next to us, not in front, not too far behind, but just this nice little sweet spot right next to us, we do have some options. Pop, which would be just a little pop to the side. Imagine that you're holding a balloon in one hand and a pin in the other, pop. So just something a little gentle just to get the dog's attention. Stop, which means everything that we were kind of practicing in step one is getting that dog into that lowering of status, um, into that sitting position, or change direction when the dog is feeling pressure so that we can help them to understand that that pressure-free zone is exactly where they wanna be. So in this step, one of the things we really wanna remember is that we cannot force acceptance. This is really imperative that we do not want to try and 
force the dog to look at us because I could even put food in my face, you know, to try and get the dog to look at me, but it doesn't create the same mindset or even the mindset that I want in the first place. So we're really, really trying to get to the concept in this very naturally ingrained instincts where the dog really does start to look at us for that guidance and leadership and that's step two of moving forward together. Step three is to create fixed space. And if you remember when we talked about the vocabulary is basically fixed space is anywhere visually different um, from the floor for the dog. So it could be a dog bed, it could be an obedience kind of place board, it could even be a rug or even a towel. We just want it to be very visually different for the dog so that we can start to help them to understand what this fixed space means. So when we're using fixed space, it means that we're using distance pressure, that's eye contact and body language to move the dog into that lowering of status into that sitting position um, onto the fixed location. So <laughs> basically utilizing the dog bed to be able to create somewhere where the dog can feel safe and comfortable. And what we're doing is utilizing the pressure that we started with the leash, we're utilizing this step to be able to translate and transfer the leash pressure so that we can start to have a dog who can live off leash. So imagine if you have company over or let's say you're cooking dinner or something like that, where you want to have the dog out with you, but you don't necessarily want the dog right underfoot. This is a great option to be able to put the dog onto that fixed space using eye contact and body language and have them just hanging out there where they can actually have their own little space and they can rest and relax, but still feel part of the family when you're doing activities like that. Um, in this step, we do not use verbal commands or release words like stay or okay. What we have found through our training is that that actually creates a lot more excitability and also anticipation of moving off of that space. So I don't want it to be like a slingshot when I'm telling the dog stay, stay, stay. Or when I take the dog off of that place, I don't wanna release them with a huge burst of excitement by saying, okay, or any way that they're just gonna blow up and blow off of this thing. It should be somewhere calm, it should be somewhere comfortable, it should be somewhere easy for them to hang out, okay? Um, the dog is always expected to remain in this space, on the fixed space, until the handler returns to calmly give affection and this is what we call condition relaxation. So anytime before we release the dog off of that place board, just like I said, you don't wanna use that big burst of excitement. This is the perfect time to go back and give affection. We use this as this nice calm massage. We don't necessarily want dogs to think that hands always mean excitement. And so we really utilize this time to be able to create a very calm mindset with the dog and the handler and now it's time for the handler to really give that nice affection to the right state of mind that the dog has, which at this point would be nice and calm. Then you're gonna change your body language and help guide the dog off of that fixed space. The most important part of the step three is working to transfer the concepts from that contact pressure, the leash work, to distance pressure. So just keep that in mind, we don't want the dog to live on the leash their entire life. And so this is where this step three really comes in handy, fixed space. Step four, to create unfixed space. So this is step four, um, which is unfixed space, which we utilize as a corrective type. Keep in mind, this is step four. So ideally steps one, two, and three get you to the point where you're spending a lot of quality time with your dog, where step four, by the time we start to utilize this, the dog's really gonna have a really nice understanding of what it means and what it's for. So basically step four is using that distance pressure to move a dog into a submissive posture to correct or slow down behaviors. So what we're doing is using this pressure to stop barking, jumping, counter surfing, rough play or other problem behaviors. Usually this is when the dog is off leash as well. So this is one of those concepts where you can correct when the dog is at liberty in your home or in the yard um, without having to have the leash on the dog. But sometimes we utilize the leash here to help them understand the process a little bit more. Um, but just know that most of this happens when the dog is off leash. And if you've done really well with steps one, two, three, this step 
is gonna come very, very quickly. The dog is gonna have a very clear understanding that the context might be a little bit different, but it's very similar to what the dog's already been utilizing. You wanna always make sure that you follow through and you wanna finish what you start. So when you're working with this, let's pretend that the dog is getting into, um, is counter surfing, right? So the dog has jumped up onto the counter, you've got something on here. So what I would do is I would get in between the dog and the counter and I would use my eye contact and body language to walk into the dog until the dog lowered its position. The only thing that I want at that point, the dog doesn't need to stay there. What I want is I want to be able to move away. So that was the correction, having the dog lower his status. I want to be able to walk away. And the only thing that the dog needs to do is to not go back to doing what it was just doing. This is a fantastic step to also be able to welcome guests into your home without having to utilize the fixed space. You can just create space around your doorway as you're welcoming your guests into your home. So when the dog moves into that lowering posture, you wanna release that distance pressure, that eye contact and body language by walking away. At that point, the dog can get up and move away, just cannot go back to doing what it was already doing before. That's why this is the corrective phase. So this really helps to teach the dog, the most important part of this step, is that this really helps to teach the dog that you control the resource of space. And that is a very important resource. A lot of people don't always think about it. They think about food, they think about water, they think about affection. But I will tell you, one of the most imperative resources that you can control is space. And this is that one step that really helps to do that. So step four, creating unfixed space. Step five, challenge. So basically what this is, is utilizing all of the things that you've practiced previous to this to be able to take your dog into areas of what we call predictable distractions or being able to set up distractions at home. And what I mean by predictable distractions, this is kind of those little things where you can really help the dog to challenge what they've learned. Not that we want to kind of over test, but we want to make sure that the dog really understands the concepts and not just the dog, but you too. Um, at this point, in step five, it's really important to practice keeping a calm mind. And I'll tell you, that's not just for the dog. That's for you as well. It's imperative that to create a calm dog, you have to be the example for your dog. If you're freaking out and panicking, there's no way that your dog is ever gonna be calm. So this is actually an exercise that you guys can practice together to be able for you to be calm and for your dog to be calm. Especially if you're working with a difficult or reactive dog, we wanna make sure that you're not reacting to a dog who's reacting with reactivity. So we wanna really help you to be able to work through that process. If the dog gets excited and ramps up, what we're gonna do is we're gonna utilize that contact pressure and what we've been practicing with a leash to help to calm them down. You can also use unfixed space to do this as well if your dog is off leash. So they ramp up, they get excited, you calm them down with pressure, whether it's contact pressure or distance pressure. If you're struggling, go back to step one or step two before moving forward. So if you have a dog who is on leash, reactive, blows up at something, I'm just gonna stand there calmly. I'm gonna utilize pressure to calm them down and then I'm gonna move forward. If I need to, I may move out of that situation to create a little bit more distance for me. But honestly, I want to be able to do everything I can to calm the dog in that situation, helping them to understand that I had control of the situation. This isn't just for reactive dogs either. This could just be for an excitable puppy. So when you're exposing them to new environments and new situations, you really have these really fantastic tools and techniques to be able to help them calm down under new circumstances, okay? This makes it very, very easy to be able to do that. And make sure that you take your time to get a good mindset before venturing out into new areas. So let's say at the beginning, it might not be about the walk. If you're planning 30 minutes for your walk, what I would do is maybe spend time getting the dog out of the crate for a little while, calming them down. They ramp up, you calm them back down, getting them out of the door. Don't just worry about going on the walk. Take each step as a learning opportunity. And remember that as you're teaching impulse control, that's what's gonna really help to burn the mind and create a really amazing relationship with you guys that the dog understands that you control 
the excitement, you control the walk, you control the pace. And by the time that you start getting out, you know, and walking around, you're gonna have that dog looking up at you. You're gonna have the focus. You're gonna have the dog who's questioning, hey, can we go out for a walk or what are we doing? And that really helps to set up that really nice dynamic and relationship between you and your dog. The most important part with step five is when things get tough, get patient. Just understand that if your dog is struggling, he's really having a difficult time, having a hard time. So make sure that you're utilizing the tools and techniques that we've put in place from steps one through four to be able to help to calm the dog down. And also keeping yourself calm, once again, is gonna be so important. So just keep in mind, take your time. Patience will always be your best tool in any given situation when your dog is struggling. Help them and guide them through the situation. So that's step five, challenge. When working with your dog through the five steps, remember, this is not forever. This is a method that helps dogs by creating a strong foundation of proper behavior. Once a foundation is put in place, everything after that becomes much easier. How long your dog is on this format depends on you and your dog. Dogs will struggle without clear set guidance from the owner. Dogs thrive on structure and discipline. And by following the information in this program, your dog will thank you.